in 2008, we switched on the Large Hadron Collider at CERN for the very first time. Our flagship LHC, the biggest scientific instrument in the world, in which we accelerate protons up to near the speed of light and collide them to study the fundamental laws of nature. Just before we switched on, stories erupted across social media that we were going to create a black hole that would swallow up the Earth. <laughs> now you, as a concerned citizen of planet Earth, would no doubt have turned to a web search to find out more. But it would have offered little solace because there is something fundamentally wrong with search, as I will illustrate with some examples from physics. So the stories spread across the web where they were analysed and sensationalised and search would return you no end of people's theories which would explain how the end of the world would come. After all, a bite-sized commentary by just about anybody tends to gather more attention than the lengthy original they're being commenting on. For example, Mainstream media interviews with CERN scientists explaining the small likelihood that it could happen were taken out of context to show there was a real chance that it would happen. <clears throat> Influencers with large audiences who saw black hole creation mentioned on the CERN website took it as a sign we were seeking destruction. And they invented explanations as to how we were going to do it. So, popular second-hand and third-hand stories snowballed and would be presented to you in your results as likely to grab your attention, submerging the factual first-hand ones. So back to my example, my illustration. If search had directed you to the CERN website, you'd have found our factual explanations of how the chances really were vanishingly small. After all, Particle collisions like those in the LHC happen naturally all the time in Earth's atmosphere, where cosmic rays streaming from supernova in the sun collide with atoms in our upper atmosphere with more energy than the uh, LHC would produce, occasionally making beautiful aurora, but certainly never destroying the Earth. The energy available in these collisions anyway could only ever create a tiny quantum black hole that would evaporate in a fraction of a second in a process predicted by Stephen Hawking. And, given the age of the Earth, we could calculate that already 3 times 10 to the 22 high-energy cosmic ray collisions had already happened in the atmosphere safely. That's 30,000 billion billion happy endings so the chances of the LHC causing a different, unhappy ending really were vanishingly small. Admittedly, scientific explanations can be a bit long and a little bit daunting. So it's no surprise, really, that the poetic simplicity of alternative facts can be so appealing to so many. One of my favourites was actually given by a prominent doomsayer who explained LHC statistics quite simply. Either CERN will end the world in a black hole, or it won't. <laughs> That's 50-50. <laughs> Would you risk the fate of the world on a toss of a coin? <laughs> Just because an explanation is given in a language familiar to you, or popular with people like you, does not mean it's true. It will grab your attention for sure, but that is no reason for a search algorithm to present it to you as the most relevant thing for you to see. Personalized search algorithms are hugely successful because they place us in a warm and cozy filter bubble, rewarding us with things we like to hear rather than challenging us with things we ought to know. These algorithms are useful when we shop or go to the cinema or have toothache, because we benefit from being presented items from websites we've visited, or recommendations from people who like the same film, or a dentist in the same region who speaks the same language. They are comfortable, they are quick. 
But to work, they need to make an accurate profile of you, to collect all the data possible about you, until they know you better than your closest friends, until they know how to draw your attention. For access to knowledge, this is irrelevant. If I search to understand how this apple will fall, it doesn't matter who I am or where I live. The laws of gravitation are the same. And I certainly should not be presented a different result depending on what I believe. The apple will fall. We need search algorithms tuned for education, not entertainment. So, how did we end up with the web search that we've got? The web was born in CERN in 1989 when Tim Berners-Lee devised a way to connect all our physicists with the information they needed. The status of the accelerators, the results of the experiments, the people, the data. It grew to other sciences, to industry, always connecting people that wanted to share their knowledge. There was no central core or control. It was a distributed system being built collectively. In Sir Tim's original proposal, he described CERN as a microcosm for the world, where CERN's myriad nationalities, cultures, and needs could hone the web ready for the world. But CERN is not typical. Our physicists are driven by common purpose and constructive goals. We didn't, we didn't prepare the web for the real world, where use cases blend with abuse cases. So fast forward 33 years, and we are now drowning in information muddled with misinformation, and worse still, disinformation. As Sir Tim says, this is not the web we want. Even when the web was in its infancy, with just a few thousand websites, it was already evident that a search would be needed to navigate, and search engines started to pop up like mushrooms. In 1997, to Stanford University academics, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, summarized the situation in the appendix of an inspirational paper. They said, the best way really was to build a distributed system, collectively, everyone contributing to the index globally. But this was unlikely to happen. So instead, a few months later, they left university and formed Google, to do precisely the opposite, to build a centralized system now driven by profit and sustained by adverts. Have you ever reflected on how often your top search results are adverts? Companies will pay gold to be presented first when you search for certain keywords. Even competitors will pay for when you search for their rivals. In fact, your attention is bought and sold before your very eyes in real-time bidding, in which ad space is auctioned in the milliseconds between your clicks. Beneath the ads are the so-called organic search results, which sound much healthier, don't they? <laughs> but even those are hotly contested by entities that will pay SEO experts to get to the top. Do we really want search at any price? Sure, we've now got over a billion websites, fake news abounds, and conspiracy theories get more attention than knowledge. So we need a search, but the search engines we have are not neutral or benevolent. They determine what data to collect from us and how to use it in algorithms. They're not open and transparent, so it's hard to spot any bias or manipulation. They profile us. They divide us. This is not the search we want. We need search algorithms tuned for humanity, not individual greed. We need to rewind. We need to take the alternative path mentioned by Sergey and Larry to build a distributed system where the web indexes can be made by the people with knowledge, with experience, who can point to the validated fresh content rather than having a company try and guess this from afar? Currently, search indexes are built by sending out automated search crawlers, which clog up our websites and waste over a quarter of the precious internet bandwidth 
trying to find pages that changed or new links to pages. That's crazy. Imagine if our roads were full of automated vehicles, constantly pausing and taking photos of the signposts to see if any had changed. Well, all you want to do is race to the supermarket. Moreover, the search crawlers currently only scratch the surface web, indexing content that's easy to access or in understandable formats. But there's a whole deep web of rich content stored in databases and dynamic websites that they hardly even notice. The people who created these are best placed to index them. A sort of global Wikipedia-like indexing workforce to create an open web index. And then presenting the results from querying that index could be done completely unfiltered, simply clustered by source, such as researched and reviewed mainstream media, uh, social media trends, independent content. And you could have the controls to dive in and explore and filter by any criteria you chose, rather than being blinkered to a subset prepared to match you. And the ratings from various fact-checker organizations could be used to red flag content. The validated would no longer get submerged under the popular. Fact would be distinct from fiction. That would be revolutionary. In our modern world, where augmented and virtual reality are all around, and deep fakes abound, it's hard to separate fact and fiction. This was illustrated a few months ago when we came to switch the LHC back on after a three-year maintenance period at the highest ever energy. The web lit up again. This time with stories that we were going to open a portal to another world. <laughs> it's, it started on TikTok but spread like wildfire until hardly any search about CERN would not return something about portals. It's understandable, really, because some of our theories are based on extra dimensions. And while the LHC was off, Netflix's Stranger Things series became popular based on demons in extra dimensions accessing the world through portals. So far-fetched. No one here would mistake it for the truth, would you? It's an extreme example of a pervasive trap we have set ourselves. In our desire for realistic entertainment, we blend science facts into our action movies and have scientists advise the movie makers. Take Interstellar. In 2014, Kip Thorne, the Nobel laureate physicist, was a consultant because key plot moments happened on planets orbiting around a massive black hole called Gargantua. Together, they devised these mind-blowing images of a black hole, based on predictions from physics that it would be made visible by a beautiful halo of luminous matter accelerating in. Five years later, the Event Horizon Telescope took this first ever real image of a black hole confirming the predictions with this beautiful, luminous halo. Now, many people believe interstellar to be science fact, extra dimensions and all. Mixing fact and fiction can make great entertainment. And going one step further, setting the plot at CERN can make it even more realistic. <laughs> but then, how do you expect people to separate fact and fiction? In a courtroom, witnesses swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Because otherwise, it's nigh on impossible to disentangle the truth. And so it is with web search. If the results are just a pile of fiction mixed with some facts, how do we expect our children to disentangle the truth? When the next generation wonder about our nearest neighbor star, Proxima Centauri, do we want them to marvel at the beauty of this image posted on Twitter, showing in great detail the plasma swarming on its surface? Or do we want to red flag it as a slice of chorizo? <laughs> we need a new web search where the validated 
can be presented alongside the fiction with clarity and balance. And so the Open Search Foundation has been launched to try and coordinate the effort. When geographic map data was opened, competition ensured we got the better road navigation systems we all love in our cars. So similarly now, we need to open the web map data, the search indexes, so that competition can get us better web navigation systems. We are building one example in the Open Web Search project. The world needs to act collectively now as a connected community to solve the catastrophic challenges that humankind is facing. So don't base your ideas on half a story or be satisfied with tools presenting only a glimpse of the full picture. Help us build the open web search if you can. And when it's ready, please choose to use it. Your choices matter. I urge you, choose connectivity over division.